Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In Any Cup Time. We're so lucky today. We have uh, who I call the Elon Musk of Cloud Native today with us. It's going to be a very interesting episode. So you better be ready for your questions. Don't forget. Uh, we have already about uh, 150 questions from social media. So if you want to ask uh, questions live, you need to uh, start with a queue in the comment section below, and we'll take a few of those uh, to ask Jody, our guest, uh, the CEO of both Harness and Traceable. And of course, uh, uh, we'll talk about how he manages to do so much uh, uh, in so little time. That's always interesting, pretty mind boggling to me. But uh, uh, before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody to, of course, uh, uh, register to our mailing list if you've not done that yet in anycoftime.tv so you can get an email every week about the next uh, videos and episodes we have. Um, of course, if you've not bought some cool uh, uh, goodies on the store in anycoftime.tv, do that. All the profits, and I say all 100% of the profits, go to uh, the Fisher House uh, foundation to help uh, our uh, veterans so please do that get a mug get a funny t-shirt with uh, uh, one of our great presidents uh, so do that uh, now uh, we have learn with nick up of course tons of training on devsecops so uh, go check that out learnwithnick.com we have uh, great discounts for everybody uh, 50 percent off for civilian uh, veterans and and uh, uh, civilian of the u.s government and military of course 20% off for everybody else. Uh, and one thing I wanted to announce, you know, we launched a new company called Ask Sage, uh, taking GPT and bringing it to the US government. So uh, many use cases, obviously, uh, we also managed to make the bot be able to answer real-time questions. So I can ask it, what, what, what is the uh, weather in the Fort Royal Airport uh, or the uh, Dulles Airport? And it's able to give me real-time answers as well. So we ingest a lot of uh, DoD content uh, uh, and, of course, all the federal regulations and things. So if you have use cases and you want to talk to us about how to use GPT to augment and drive outcomes uh, for the federal uh, government, or state and local government, of course, uh, reach out to us. We have already 17 teams uh, pushing ideas from the acquisition standpoint, from the intelligence standpoint. Uh, so a lot of different great use cases. So check check it out, uh, asksage.ai. You can go and create an account and access the bot for free right now. So do that, have fun, and let us know what you think. With that, and we're pretty excited to have Jody join us. Uh, he's a serial, real serial entrepreneur, not only a serial entrepreneur, but uh, he's able to build uh, unicorns for a living. Uh, visionary, of course, uh, uh, believes in the ability of software to change the world for the better. He co-founded Harness in 2017, uh, not only to automate and simplify the software delivery process, and he, he served as a CEO, and he, he just announced today an acquisition of the company. We'll love to hear more about uh, uh, that as well. That's going to be a kind of a breaking news kind of thing. Um, in 2018, he co-founded Traceable, and uh, Traceable is the leading uh, API security platform. In fact, last week, you got to hear about uh, Traceable uh from their CISO. So Richard Bird was here on the show to if you missed the episode, go check it out on YouTube slash Nicolas Chillon. You're gonna be able to see uh, Richard uh, uh, episode which was you know mind boggling again full of great information about API security. So uh, check that out. Of course because you know running two companies is just not enough uh, for Jody. He also has a, a, a VC called Unusual uh, ventures and uh, is is completely reinventing the the VC model. Uh, it provides entrepreneurs uh, um, um, uh, immense amount of of uh, services that that nobody else really even thought about. Um, they they just closed their uh, third fund in twenty two uh, with about a billion with a B uh, under management. And uh, uh, before that, in uh, two thousand eight, uh, Jody founded uh, a, a company you all know, App Dynamics. Uh, which uh, uh, exited to uh, Cisco uh, for 3.7 uh, billion with another B. Again, is a recipient of multiple awards, uh, of course. Uh, best uh, cloud computing CEO to work for, which is a fun one. Uh, <laughs> the uh, best CEO with uh, Ernest Young, Entrepreneur of the Year as well uh, for North Carolina and many more. He has uh, fancy diplomas, but we don't really care about degrees here, so. Uh, and uh, is the lead inventor of 20 patents. Uh, that wasn't enough to do all this stuff. So uh, if you want to find him, he's on uh, LinkedIn. You have the link here. 
uh, Richard uh, is is amazing. You can follow him. He's already uh, pretty busy, obviously, but uh, follow his post every every uh, you know few days. You get a lot of great insight. So with that, let's bring him on the show. Happy to have you. So excited. How have you been? Uh, hi, Nick. <clears throat> excited to be here. Uh, and thanks for all the kind kind words. You know, I would take uh, Elon Musk comparison as a compliment. I guess. Yes. Yeah. Forget about the the bad stuff about Elon yeah. Musk. Yeah. Nobody cares. I'm talking about the good side, the, the good the, 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 that everybody knows he, he kind of changing the world and doing all the good stuff. He's one of the best. Tesla and SpaceX. Time, so, yes. Yeah. So he's, he's, uh, he's uh, you know, thinking outside the box like you. Right. So, uh, you know, what we always start on the show is giving a chance uh, to the guests to tell us a little bit about uh, their journey. So we'll do that with you first and then we'll dig into some fun questions. Uh, sure, I'll start my journey. My journey, I I, I was uh, born in India, grew up in a small town in India, and um, I was always fascinated by engineering, by by science. You know, my grandfather was a metallurgist, my father was an electrical engineer, running a small business. So to me, it was like you know, engineering and business that kind of stuff always uh, was very interesting. So I went to uh, one of the the top technical universities in India. Uh, you know, I know. Talk about we don't care about diplomas. I don't either. Uh, but you know, once uh, I, I studied computer science engineering in, in school. Uh, but after that, I was fascinated by where the innovation is happening. And you know, Silicon Valley uh, seemed like the place where all the innovation was happening in software. So I was like, let's let's go to Silicon Valley. And uh, that's how I came to came to the U.S. Uh, to, to, uh, to Silicon Valley uh, to try to see like you know how can I make a make make impact through innovation through software over here. And um, you know, I worked as as a, as a software engineer, you know, running multiple software engineering projects in in, in a whole bunch of companies, different companies. In two thousand seven, I got uh, really fascinated and almost I would say uh, frustrated by problems we had in software. Like you know, as if you if you are a developer and you're building complex distributed systems and things go wrong in in in, in, your, in your in your software and things go wrong, how do you troubleshoot it? How do you fix it? How do you diagnose the root cause? And that could get very, very complicated and messy. And that's where uh, I started AppDynamics, which was a really a product to solve that problem. Like, can we can we watch everything that's going inside the software? Can we instrument every single line of code and see what's happening in, in runtime in production? So if something goes wrong, you can troubleshoot and fix it very quickly. Right. So that was the you know my first company, AppDynamics, that I started back then. Uh, AppDynamics, I ran the company uh, you know until 20, 2015. Uh, and in 2017, we sold the company in the beginning of 2017 to Cisco uh, for for 3.7 billion dollars. Uh, and you know, for me, the uh, what I always looked at, you know, the, the so much opportunity in the in the in the developer ecosystem. Like you know, uh, my primary thesis is that we are going through this uh, massive transition in the world, right? You know, a big revolution in the world that's being driven by software. Like you know, you had the the you know the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution and you know, if people will call this era, this really will be the software revolution era, right? So, and you have, you know, 30, 35 million software developers in the world, you know, about $3 trillion, trillion with a T, uh, is, is being spent on writing software code, but it's full of inefficiencies. And it's the, the entire process is kind of broken. And I would say it's, it's still in the early uh, evenings of, you know, how good software engineering could be done. And that's the, you know, so I get fascinated by those kind of problems. And, you know, after, uh, you know, my first company I've done was sold to Cisco. I, you know, I was like, we have so many problems left in the developer world. <laughs> let's 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 uh, let's let's uh, solve some of them. And that's when I started Harness, and then later on Tracer. Yeah, it's it's amazing. You know, I think, uh, you know, when you look at the exit with uh, with Cisco, um, the fact that they the company is still here, right? I mean, it's just you, you see a lot of exits where the company ends up destroying kind of the, the baby that you built. Mm -hmm. uh, but but in this case, um, you know, the product was so resilient and, and powerful that even a large team couldn't let it go behind and 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 is still relevant today. You know, people uh, still massively use uh, the, the stuff you built. What, what does that make you feel when you see, you know, the, the, the product still being uh, relevant in 2023? Yeah, no, you know that definitely makes me feel good that we built the right foundation. I think the the core thesis that we invented in AppDynamics was that uh, this notion of a distributed trace or a transaction, like you know the how you monitor something is not what's happening on one server. You monitor the user transaction, like what a user does, and that has lasted over over you know more than a decade. That concept because we brought in the 
that concept as, as among the, the, the first company. Uh, we had the, the right kind of innovation and the foundation around it. And we focus on very complex systems, very complex enterprises, very complex uh, software applications, which require a lot of distributed systems. So that's where you know AppDynamics uh, uh, was 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 the strongest product. And we were among the most innovative companies in in, in that space, the observability uh, monitoring company. Uh, I would say you know uh, in hindsight, you know if you were independent, who knows we might be innovating even more. But I would say right. I, would, I, would, I would give credit to Cisco. Cisco is a is, is is great in acquiring like compared to some other other larger companies you know they do a good job they have the whole uh, you know uh, let's say a, a system figured out on how do you how do you bring in good products good technologies and how do you execute well on it after execution so definitely kudos to uh, uh, to, to, to them to do that you know what obviously like you know as I'm, I'm a product guy so when i hear like you know we are using your product like even now like you know someone uh, is like hey we are using app dynamics and we like we love app dynamics here it definitely makes me very, very, very proud, and you know, uh, it's a, it's kind of a fulfilling moment that you're really solving a problem for for someone. But I also like you know, also another part that's fulfilling for me is more on the the human side of it. Like you know, the you know, it's a, there was a big exit for App Dynamics, so we had like you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. You know, I, I, I think more than 400 people who made millions of dollars in you know financially. But it's a life change changing outcome for for like you know for a lot of people. And sometimes I get a text from someone, hey, I just bought a new house and you know thanks for the dynamic stock you know I, I find that the most fulfilling like you know okay it's not just we made an impact with the product but we also made an impact in so many uh, so many of our employees lives yeah we'll we'll talk later but there is there is something that's very unique which is how many people have followed you throughout the years and despite many of them making money and don't have to to do work you know they they still wanted to remain and be part of the the journey with you and and that is that shows a lot about your skills as a manager and and you know as uh, as someone that cares about people because you know if you look at all the companies uh, value proposition that you built it's always a, been about uh, bringing tangible value to people right so it's always about it's not just the fancy tech piece right i mean there's obviously fancy tech right but the outcome right is always uh, about the, the the people and 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 the fact that they followed you like this. I have a few people like you know like you. I I founded twelve companies, not as big as yours, but um, you know they I have people for fifteen years. You know that that just that tells about the fact that those guys really would follow you anywhere, and that that's pretty cool. So um, with that, let's go into the real meat, right? Uh, obviously, you know we have we have had a great episode with Rachel last week about uh, API security and the landscape and you know where nation state are going and uh, why all this matters with the recent breaches and stuff. But Harness is uh, obviously complementary. You know, obviously I, I see teams uh, using both. Uh, obviously, you're not competing with with yourself. But the the Harness capability is really focused on you know, solving and bringing tangible solutions to uh, streamline the developer experience. So tell us a little bit about uh, what problems really you're trying to solve uh, when it comes to Harness. Yeah, I would say the what we are trying to solve at Harness is number one is to simplify and streamline the software delivery process. And that the software del developers write code and the code goes in the hands of the end user. There's a long process, uh, you know, that happens in between. How can we make it reliable, consistent, streamlined? Uh, you know, so that's that's the the you know, which is really you know what people have tried to do with with all kind of DevOps approaches. You know, we look at like how do, can we make DevOps scale and simplified and work in a consistent, reliable manner through 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 a right product. The, the the main impact of that is to remove the toil out of the developers. Like the developer experience is bad because they are wasting so much time in in kind of the grunt work, toil, unnecessary things that could be. You know, uh, automated. That's not really the core part of innovation that they are supposed to do, right? So, if you if you look at most of the developers, and you do, we we you know, you've done multiple surveys. In most organizations, they're only spending about like you know, uh, twenty to forty percent of the time coding and building things. Like the rest of the time is spent on you know, waiting for approvals and you know, getting the builds to finish and troubleshooting deployments or babysitting a deployment or you know, generating a compliance report or you know, uh, all sort of stuff that happen around it that you could really solve, simplify and automate and give developers like, you know, almost like half of the time back. So that's what, that's the primary goal at Harness. Like, can we take out the, take the entire software delivery process and take all the toil out of the software delivery process, automate it, simplify it, make it reliable and consistent 
so that the developer experience is not impacted by all the toil and they can go and do their, their job, which is to build innovative uh, solutions to, to, the, to the problems that they want to solve. And, you know, for people that don't know, because some may not know uh, what toil is, obviously it's anything that, you know, should be automated that uh, is not, you know, bringing tangible value to your day-to-day -day work. And uh, ruthless automation, as I call it, we have a video on Learn with Nick. I'll put the link for people to go watch it on what toil is and uh, also uh, how, how to prioritize. And so effectively, right, what you end up doing here is, is looking at all the bottlenecks and all the... Uh, the foundational pieces of the puzzle to do uh, build software in a modern universe from uh, from the CI/CD standpoint, from the uh, uh, you know the the, the feature uh, standpoint, from the the cost uh, mm -hmm. tracking your your cloud costs and spending, which most people don't realize they probably can save mm -hmm. you know forty percent of their costs. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you, the government definitely is probably mm -hmm. double. Uh, you can probably save a hundred percent of the cost. <laughs> Just with the is very doable. Yes. So. Yeah, it's just so, so all these pieces, right? That that, uh, and I'm gonna post the link here, uh, so people can later uh, check out the the toil because you know it's interesting how still a lot of people don't understand the concept of toil, right? And and I think it's it's so important that you uh, you manage to not only explain it but you also looked at the biggest uh, uh, you know biggest bottlenecks, right? And uh, uh, so when you look at the competition, right? Uh, obviously, a lot of companies can, you know, claim they do similar things, right? Mm -hmm. Because you look at uh, companies like GitLab, they're mm -hmm. becoming this one-stop shop, right? Mm -hmm. Way beyond, you know, source repository now. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, GitLab CI is uh, is a is a massive uh, um, deployment in 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 DoD, for example. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you see? How do you see you compete mm -hmm. against those guys? Yeah. You know, it's a first of all, it's a it's literally a trillion dollar problem. Like you know, if you look at the it's the plenty of, of you know yes. so the amount of money being spent with software developers, you know, about three trillion dollars. You know, with uh, you know, if you look at like about thirty million software developers, average cost of a developer is at least hundred thousand dollars. You know, if you average across the world, uh, so that's about three trillion dollars, and about at least about forty percent is wasted in the toil. So that you are looking at one point two trillion dollars that's being wasted in the toil. That could, be, that, that, that wow. could be saved, right? So, so if we are looking at a, at, at a trillion dollar problem. So I'm, I'm glad that there are multiple companies and multiple people are trying to solve that problem and remove the developer toil and bring the right kind of experience. We are coming from a diff, little bit of a different directions and different point of views though. Like, you know, um, GitLab, uh, you know, then they've done an excellent job coming from the source code management and, you know, focusing on source code management and, you know, some of the CI aspects. You know, we, we started, you know, uh, our journey from the other direction, which is to, how do you simplify the complex deployments? Like, you know, if you have a deployment, you know, and, and you bring deployments with right degree of automation, right degree of reliability, right degree of, uh, you know, security, governance, compliance, and, and solve the production deployment challenges, which is the, which we thought was the least uh, uh, solved problem, you know, in the entire CICD DevOps ecosystem. So we, if we start, we took the CD part of CICD and we said, okay, let's build the, a product that's focused on solving the CD part of CICD in the best possible way. And that's where our 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 you know first start is you know which is different than GitLab where the first start was source code management but we are directionally trying to solve eventually the same problem like remove the developer toil you know coming from different kind of directions there are areas where we are exceptionally strong at you know there are some areas that they are strong at the approach that we take um, is you know not force our customers to you know pick everything from us like we look we 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 take an approach of very modular approach. Which is like everything is designed as a, as a module which you can plug and play. You know, if you like, so that's code a big that's a big big difference, right? With the monolithic thing. I mean, GitLab is containerized and use microservices, but you cannot just buy a piece of it. You get all of it or nothing. Yeah, well, and that's the challenge, like you know, because you, you we believe in like you have to give people the choice, like you know, if you if you like the source code management from GitLab, you know, use that, and you know, if you if our CD is the is the best CD, uh, you know, in the market, you can plug that in. You know, if our right. feature flex is the best in the market, you know, you can plug that in. So we 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 take that approach of like being very modular, but also the reason we also take it is like you know it it uh, it, it it makes us you know internally uh, you know uh, pushes us to be very competitive in each of those different areas. Like when we look at you know how we build CI, we look at how do we build the best CI in the in the market. You know, when we do CD, how do we build the best CD? When we look at feature flags, how we do in the best feature flag? And then now it's the choice of the of of, of the customer and the user. 
Like, do they want that particular module from us or not? And everything we we plug it plug plug into even all our competitors. Like, you know, if our, so we we create a very open ecosystem around it where you can take take our take our modules. Uh, the other other key, uh, like when now if you like drill down one level is like you know e each of your modules. What makes our module different and innovative in the market? A key part of our modules uh, that you know on almost all of our modules, why they are different is the use of ML and AI to solve the problem in a, in a in a better way. Like if you look at like say you know deploying code, you know or building code, like you know these workflows have existed in in many ways for a long time, like 10, 15 years now. You know, it's so, but these workflows were not very intelligent. There is no intelligence in the workflow. If you look at like deployment, the biggest challenge in an in a automated deployment that you want to do continuous delivery, which is deployed 10 times a day, you know, developer makes a code change, it goes through a pipeline and you deploy. The biggest challenge is how do you make sure nothing breaks? You know, so you can you can automate the workflow of, you know, just the, the, the deployment scripting, which is what people have done, you know, in, in the past, but it doesn't have intelligence on making sure that nothing is going to break. So that's where when we came in the market, we said, okay, let's solve the problem by bringing data and intelligence on top of the data to, to solve that. Like, you know, can we, can we pull in data from all your monitoring systems, all your logging systems, create these machine learning models of what is the normal behavior of every, any piece of software, you know, any, any microservice, any transaction that's happening inside a microservice, you know, how does it, how does it perform? Like, you know, there's data is there in AppDynamics or Datadog or Splunk or, you know, um, Elastic, the data is there. Can you pull in the data, learn the normal models, and use that to make the decisions in the pipeline, in the deployment pipeline, right? So now you can use it to, you know, use to do canary deployments, for example, or blue green deployments, and compare the impact when the change is happening, or when you move from staging to production. All of the decision making in the pipeline can can become more intelligent, and when you have intelligent decision making, the whole thing could be automated much better. So that's kind of the the approach that we bring in, like you know, that you historically what happened was. The world of DevOps is around like you automate things ruthlessly, but there is intelligence and data sitting somewhere, which is in your observability, monitoring, all kind of different systems. But they were so disjointed, you know. So you know, from my background, from AppDynamics, I come from the world of you know data and observability. I was like, why don't we bring the data and observability very seamlessly, tightly integrated into the the, the workflow of DevOps and make that workflow five x, ten x more better. Right. So, you know, that's so that's the approach we have taken in, like, you know, how we brought in the most innovative CD in the market. When we look at CI, same thing, like, you know, we started with CD, but we said, OK, let's solve the problem of CI as well. And think of CI from first principles again. You know, um, you know by the way, you, that the Elon Musk comparison, that's the one thing I always like about him, that first principles kind of thinking of when he's trying to solve a problem. And we looked at CI, like, what do people don't like about CI? And it all comes down to the builds are too slow. Like, you know, if you ask a developer, what is the, the fundamental problem is, I have to wait 30 minutes or an hour or two hours for my builds to run. So we look, we looked at, you know, you know, that people have been doing the CI workflow in you know, starting in Jenkins for like 15 years. And now like, you know, GitLab CI, you're all kind of CI things, but the workflow is essentially the same. The user experience is slightly better, but the workflow is essentially the same. Like, you know, that you just specify, you know, how to compile your code and you run a SQL, you know, bunch of tests and test pass or fail. There is no intelligence in the workflow. So we looked at like, if you have to fundamentally solve the problem in the CI, you have to bring some intelligence into it into solving the core problem, which is how do you speed up the builds? Like, so we, uh, so we, we, we build a lot of intelligence techniques around it. You know, one we call test intelligence, which is like, which is like, say as a developer, you made 50 lines of code change and in your suite of 300 or 3000 tests, you really need to run all 3000 tests. Can you create an intelligence model that can figure out like, you know, what is the impact of that 50 lines of change and what code, what tests really need to be run? So can you bring it down from 3000 tests to 300 tests? And not compromise on quality at all, you know, with with, with like hundred percent confidence on it. So now you cut down your, you know, your your build and test time significantly, right? So you so we we bring in a lot of kind of intelligence techniques to CI also to to solve the the problem. So when when people think of like what is different about you know your approach at Harness and how we are solving these problems to how pe other people have done is I would say like you know we are the only solution or only company that's very focused on let's take each of these developer or DevOps workflows and bring data and intelligence into it to to remove the toil and automate that workflow to the next to the to the next level yeah that, that's you know the, the intelligence piece and the behavior looking at the, the telemetry piece obviously that's you know that that must take a very special kind of talent of course you're using algo uh, as a foundation to your cd piece um so when you look at the, the landscape right you look at uh, you started with, with cd and then you know ci and the feature stuff and the cloud costs um, 
and of course you said you know GitLab started with the source code side. The world obviously is embracing GitOps, right? So the source of truth and the the, the Git repo is becoming kind of this this crown jewel. Uh, do you see yourself having to look into source code as as a capability to to go to the GitOps true source of truth? You know, uh, S bomb, you know, signing all that stuff. Are you thinking of uh, going into the source code side of the world a little bit? Uh, yeah, you know, I think eventually we we will. You know, the, uh, there is no doubt about that. You know, we are systematically building out the, the entire entire software delivery process and managing source code is part of it. But if you think about managing source code and the GitOps, you know, it really comes down to three different things. Like, you know, putting your 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 application source code into a into a into a Git repo source code management. Then you have your pipelines. You know, you want to um, ideally manage your pipelines or the the entire deployment tooling and the build tooling in a repo as well. You know the, the you know what we call pipeline as code or you know what industry has been calling that now and the third is the you know the the, the git ops on for kubernetes deployments right where the state of kubernetes is also stored in a git repo uh yeah. you know it's like where argo cd and flux and you know kind of approaches have have have, uh, have driven that and becoming uh, becoming very popular there so we we, we break the problem into like in, into 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 those three so you know uh, the, uh, what we do extremely well at harness and uh, is, is is the GitOps part of like deploying on Kubernetes through the you know through the the state syncing that's happening through a Git repo like the so Argo CD is built inside Harness so you know if you if you get Harness CD you know there is Argo CD that's built inside it to do the the two GitOps kind of deployments uh, to do do that uh, and you know we are we are flexible on where do you keep your you know you can keep in GitHub you can keep in you know GitLab you can keep in Bitbucket you know we integrate with with, with everything but when we also look at like all our our you know whatever we do like all our pipelines. We strongly believe in pipeline as, uh, pipelines as code. Like, so that everything is built around the pipeline as code, where the pipelines are also stored in your Git repos, wherever your Git repos are. And you know, those, uh, you know, and everything is done as a, you know, how a developer will, will develop code is how you develop your pipelines, you branch your pipelines, you test your pipelines, you know, you uh, they automatically sync from your from um, from your Git repos. That's part is there. Now the, the last part is the, the your actual source code, like your application source code. Keeping that in a Git repo, and we, we obviously we, when we are building and compiling and you know and deploying something, you're pulling in from your Git repos, and we integrate with every 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 Git repo, and we you know and uh, that's how our approach, like you know, very open and you know open ecosystem that you can plug and play and integrate with whatever you have, and that's what we'll continue to do. But at, at some point of time, we will definitely look inside, you know, expanding and having that built in into into our platform as well. Yeah. So so obviously with, with all the 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 intelligence piece you were talking about. You know, I started obviously my, my this new company, Asage, you know, based on, on GPT with OpenAI, right, as, as a partnership. Um, and, you know, obviously talent is tough, right? You, you, you know, finding great um, AI ML people is, is always interesting. Mm -hmm. Although I guess there is some people getting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, let go. So that might help a little bit uh, moving forward. But uh, how has it been for you to find the talent for for that piece of the because it's it's, it's mixing the DevSecOps world and the AI world, right? So yeah, <laughs> well, it's it is always hard to get good talent, like and especially good uh, AI and ML talent. But we have we have been pretty fortunate, like to bring some of the some of the, the really good data scientists, really good ML engineers, uh, good data pipeline, data process engineers to help us through those. <laughs> you know, our approach to it is, you know, ML and AI could be very generic sounding many times. And we actually at Harness, we kind of ban that, like, don't use, don't say like we use AI in our product, just say what problem yeah. are we solving, right? You know, yeah. so the, well, the problem we are solving is how do we make the builds go faster? To go builds, to go faster, like, you know, normally about 80% of the build time is running tests. So can we cut down your test time by 30, 40% by being more intelligent about it? So our, our AI is focused on like, just like laser yeah. focused on solving that problem. We don't care like you know what how we solve it is really that is the outcome that the user wants like you know can you cut down my test time by 50 60 70 percent there and make the build go faster so that's yeah. so, you know we don't think of like you know generic ai in at least in our in our, in, no in buzzwords our, because that becomes very buzzwordy right yeah. so it's, it's the outcome like you know same thing when we look at deployments you know we, we introduced this concept called continuous verification you know when we when we first uh, you know launched our product which is really about you know how do you verify continuously if like you know if a code change is going to break something or not then that is where the the you know our ai approaches come in to the bringing telemetry learning the normal models but it's uh, but it's about it really comes down to can you reliably make sure that you know uh, to do a canary deployment like what the, the outcome is 
is an automated reliable canary deployment like whereas our ai is verifying like you know what's what when you're doing the sending the canary in the coal mine with the new code you know you can compare that with what's happening you know with, with everything else with the old code and that's reliable and automated right so the so our engineering the ai engineering approach to it is very very like pointed outcome oriented like you know that that, that we solve that particular problem there like when we look at we, we are bringing ai techniques into cloud cost management like which is also like figuring out you know when a machine is is going to sit idle based on your like especially your dev and test machines and you know can we automatically bring it down and when the when we when we think the machine would be needed we bring it back uh, back again right but again is that outcome is that you know your dev and test machines are sitting idle like 60 70% of the time so can we use some intelligence to to automate the the management of that like you know and remove all of that the the waste that is happening on your in your cloud for your dev and test machines but, but so i do think like you know yes you can build generic ai and you know you have the the great projects around it but i, I feel like our job at harness is to not think about generic ai but to think about the the, the particular you know the the problem that we want to solve outcome, yeah the real outcome yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I love it. You know, so many companies have all the buzzwords. In fact, maybe my company has a lot of the buzzwords uh, with all the GPT stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 just interesting how um, ninety five percent of my code was actually gen generated by the the AI itself, right? Mm -hmm. Even the logo of my company was generated by the AI. So it's like soon we don't have to do any work, you know. So it's mm -hmm. interesting. I think Chat so, GPT is is groundbreaking for sure. Like you know, I I do yeah. think we see a lot of impact on. How software development, software engineering is done. Obviously, you'll see a lot of work on the the marketing side. I feel kind of bad for marketers, like you know, half of their yes. their their press releases and content could be you know could be could be done well. You know, when it comes oh, to the yeah. coding, coding side for developers, I do think there's you know uh, there's a lot of productivity gain that could be done. I don't think it will replace a developer, but it can no, no, no. it can assist it by might. doing like 50, 60, 70 percent of the job. I mean, I can tell you, for me, it was more like eighty five percent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, all the code I had to do for the UI backend SQL, uh, you know, the term and conditions for the legal stuff was 100% the bar. I mean, it's just it's just very interesting. But anyway, mm -hmm. so obviously you talked a lot about developer experience, right? Mm -hmm. There is a lot of issues. You know, you talk about time. Time is obviously valuable, right? But there, there's also security issues, right? We see developers uh, forget about cyber, right? Uh, moving fast is great, right? But if you move fast and you build, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of uh, future tech debt, that's obviously not ideal. So when you think of the problem, right? Uh, you mentioned a lot uh, so far, the, the, the timeliness and the saving of time. What other things uh, do you think is important when it comes to developer experience? Yeah, I think the, the number one thing uh, I feel is uh, is to remove the barriers. Like you know, if you the, if you if you give developers a lot of barriers that you have to go through this approval and that check and balance and this approval and it all takes time. All the you know, so it creates a lot of bottleneck and developers get very frustrated and their experience is not good. So you want, yeah. but but the reality is you want to have the checks and balances. You want you to have the, the, the controls, you know, you can't, you know, it's you, it, you can't run with like, you know, move fast and break things. The, the you know, the, the Facebook mantra from the, from the, from the old days. In DoD. You don't want to do that with jets yes, and planes. You know, you, and, yeah. you know actually when, when we launched Harness, one of the tagline we used, which was pretty popular was move fast and not break things. And that was like, you know, how do we make sure that you move fast and not break things was a play on the Facebook, uh, you know, tagline at that time. Uh, it's a. Uh, so the only way to solve that is automating the controls like you know because you can't take away the controls and you know the checks and balances and and you know and and all the gates so you have to automate those you know if you automate those and you give the developers guardrails where you say okay these are the guardrails you know where you you know you have to you you know your number of vulnerabilities cannot be more than this or you cannot have these kind of vulnerabilities or your cost of your application cannot go up or you know you have to have run like you know at this level of you know performance uh, uh, you know, score at least or quality score at least. So you give them that those guardrails and you force the, you know, enforce those guardrails in your pipelines. Like, you know, those guardrails are there automated in the pipelines. Like, you know, something is checking, like, you know, are you meeting all the guardrails, or, you know, without a human trying to, 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 to figure it out. And, you know, then the developers have freedom. Like, you know, that these, they know the rules, they know that these are the guardrails, they can go and innovate and run as fast as they can within those. And if they, if they, if they, if they, if they, if they violate the guardrails, you know, the, something will automatically stop them. And maybe they need to go and a special approval in that case. Like it's only so one out of one out of hundred times you need to get a special approval, and the rest of the times, you know, you're free to go. To me, that I I, I always feel is the single most important thing that you know, because developers need freedom. 
you know they need they want to innovate at, at some velocity you know development is a creative field in some ways you know so if you create a lot of like you know uh, barriers they just you know it's frustrating experience uh, you know for 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 a developer so you have to automate the guardrails and uh, you know in, in in your pipelines and create an exception process around it that's if you do that you know you you can really improve the developer experience and and a lot of it comes down to you know guardrails around quality around security around performance around around cost also you know as you move in the cloud that becomes a developer responsibility as well you know uh, and you you automate all of that and you create visibility uh, you know around all of that so so you know obviously when you look at the bottlenecks right um a lot of it used to be manual checks or you know second human approval mm -hmm. right uh, in duty I, I i implemented you know removing a lot of the monthly yearly massive bottlenecks to move to you know uh multi-party uh review you know sometimes you know for nuclear stuff obviously it's, it's, it could be four or five people having to review the code and stuff which you know, is nuclear stuff you know so obviously that's pretty mm -hmm. critical stuff and then for other stuff, like, you know, okay, you know, maybe you need just a second person to review the code and stuff. So how much do you see intelligence and kind of the the, the AI work you're thinking about also be able to uh, completely automate some of these bottlenecks? I, I do think, you know, that's the, if you look at the, the chat GPT, open AI kind of technologies, the code review is definitely a process that could be heavily automated. Because you could, yeah. you could figure out like, you know, what potential bugs are, if it's a code written properly or not. You know, what, what a lot of automation like we do at Harness is, is to run the tests and force outcomes of those. Like, you know, to make sure that the, you know, the, the performance tests are run on the new code change and the new code will not perform any slower than your, your previous code. You know, mm. or, if it, or if it does, then things will stop automatically in the pipeline. Wow. Or we are comparing like, you know, when you ship new code, are there new vulnerabilities that got introduced? You know, if there are no new vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities are same as what we were you're shipping before, that was fine. But a new That is huge, right? And you that is massive. You track that. Uh, you know, we're also looking at like you know uh, uh, enforcement around like you know, have you run the right kind of test? Like, have you run full suite of functional tests? You know, and what and, and as, you know some functional tests starting to break. What will happen? So all those kind of the, the enforcement around you know what the the checks mean could be could be could could be automated around the code. So you want the the, the code review process, which is like someone is looking at the code and saying is the code written properly? Where you can I do think where the the AI can really help there. But then there is a lot of things that you have to enforce, like, you know, like what changed, like what is the impact of that code change on, on new vulnerabilities and performance and quality and even cost. Like, you know, you, you when you deploy this new code, yeah. you deploy it to a small environment to just to test it out and see, OK, is the, the cost per, per you know, uh, transaction or is it going up significantly? So if you deploy this code, your cloud cost bill is going to go up or not. Right. So you can automate some of that as well in the in the in before you before before you do, do things. That's huge. I, by the way, I don't think anyone mentioned this to me before in your marketing uh, slash sales team stuff uh, engagements. Uh, the 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 tracking of performance uh, drift and, and and kind of you know cloud compute and stuff that, that I've I don't know anyone doing this. And and I can tell you obviously uh, all that telemetry and and the, the the keeping track of you know you mentioned vulnerabilities too, right? I remember working with, uh, you know, CloudBees when I was in the government and they had a, quite a lot of tech that, you know, 12 years old, obviously Java app mm -hmm. with a bunch of plugins. Right. Um, and they were uh, trying after me getting angry a few times to tackle down, uh, you know, that 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 the, the, the number of CVEs they had in, in the in the product. But but they would do that. But but then the new the new features and the developers had, had no process to scan the new dependencies and so they would bring new tech that and new mm. dependencies uh, by the time you know they they don't they are, they're done typing and, and so not only they would try to you know take down the legacy debt but then they would create new debt so you're saying uh, effectively you you will see that not only uh, here's the, the 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 vulnerabilities you already had but mm. oh by the way now with this new code you're you're increasing the risk with these new uh, features. Exactly. And that's what we call, you know, security testing orchestration. And most of our uh, customers, uh, you know, in the, especially in the regulated uh, industries or, or government would use that uh, to integrate then in the, in the CI CD process. Like where you, yeah, where the SDO you, product. SDO. Yes, so, so people have not seen it, they have to go check out. That mm -hmm. was honestly the uh, piece that impressed me the most. I think, the rest, you have a lot of great pieces put together and, you know, there's a lot of innovation. 
Mm-hmm. But but that specifically to me, you know, we, we actually build something uh, in in the Air Force and, and DOD to, to try to do this. But it was a massive amount of pain. If, if you guys were there back when we started four years ago uh, with STO, it would have been like a no brainer, right? It's just well, you know, yeah, the it's, amount of pain. It's, you know? it's never never too late. You know, we can still help the, yes. the, the Air Force. Yes. You know, I'm sure people people are listening. They they have to check it out. So yes. it's just we, by the way, we do it on our own pipelines as well. Like you know, so we, you gave the cloud bees example, but they were having these problems. But, you know, we, we we initially had these problems as well, and we said, okay, we have to use our own own enforcement. Like so, our now it's like you know our CI/CD pipelines are are running all the security scans with like you know seven eight different kind of uh, uh, scanners and looking for vulnerabilities. And you know, if, if a new vulnerability get introduced, the pipeline stops. You can't ship it. Until you go and fix it, you know, it just so it's just not it's not when you know, unless it gets a very very special approval, you cannot ship it. Uh, right. So that, so it's all automated, so we don't get to the this state of like you know while we are fixing something, we are introducing more and more. And, and another key thing that we also uh, address there is the is the deduplication of vulnerabilities because you know when you are running these pipelines, you have a lot of different kind of scanners and they're all kind of bring the same vulnerabilities and then you have like a list of like thousands of them. You aggregate the findings into one. Yes, one the that. That's huge. We, we had to do that because we use Twistlock and Onco and we had to merge them and deduplicate de- them. Yeah, so that's something we are automatically doing it. So, you know, or you can bring all your different scanners. You know, we integrate with like 30, 35 different scanners, uh, you know, commercial, open source, all kind of different scanners. You know, we'll deduplicate the results and kind of track like, you know, which vulnerabilities existed before and now it's like that if there's a drift there, you know, you can stop the pipeline, the code doesn't go forward, etc. Yeah, that that is huge because we we had to build this uh, this UI for companies to come and justify the findings. So they have to come and tell us, hey, why do we have these CVEs and what is your plan to come and fix them? And oh, by the way, we're going to give you X number of days in, in the SLA to come and do it. If you don't do it, then you'll you'll mm-hmm. deaccredit it and you cannot, you know, do business with DOD anymore. So it was always a pretty good stick we had <laughs> to to tell people to maybe you can give STO to to Cloudbees. You know that that could that could be helpful. We, we would so. we will be happy to. So now you know obviously we talk a little bit about cyber with you know with STO now, but uh, you know the developer experience. Let's face it, right? I'm a cyber guy. I'm a, I'm a developer. It's pretty rare, right? Most people are just one or the other. Um, and, and usually the cyber guys will be way too stringent and create a disastrous uh, developer experience, right? And, and then the developers couldn't care less about cyber, which leads to a uh, catastrophe, right? So so how do you find the middle ground there? You know, I think the, the main thing that's uh, that's that has to happen, and I do think it's starting to happen, is bringing them two together a bit more. But developers have to care about cyber a bit more, and the cyber has to care about developer experience a bit more. Because if we keep that, keep them like like this, like you know, yeah, they, they, they have they, they can, they have a wall be, between them. Yes, yeah. and we you know what we saw that between Dev and Ops, like you know, 10, 15 years ago, that you know, that's when the DevOps movement started because Dev and Ops were like that. You know, I do think yeah. like you know, the, the, so that's why the DevSecOps, like now you have Dev and Ops, but security has to come in the same mix together. Like you can't have yeah. this for siloed uh, siloed kind of approach, and so that's definitely one part. But I do think the cyber uh, people are realizing that to, the best way to secure the code. Is to automate a lot of things in the you know in Good the problem. in the CI CD yeah. processes in the Shifting development left. processes shift left you know secure development you know so I, I, that realization is happening on the cyber side you know cyber side historically has been you give us the code and then we will look at like you know is it acceptable or not you know if, if, instead of that if you shift left and say okay you know we, even when you write the code we'll tell you like you know it's it's a problem so you fix it right there so it's not like a month later or two weeks later we're telling you like you know it's acceptable or not. And uh, you know that that I would say is very key. The more you can shift left, uh, and the the better coordination uh, coordination it would be. I think the second part is very key is is visibility. Like developers historically didn't even know the you know uh, what's happening from a security perspective. Yeah. So the and developers would be like you know it's almost because things were so siloed. I do think they need to start speaking the same kind of language. Like you know that you know these are the vulnerabilities in your code, and this is the impact of those vulnerabilities. Because if you give developers a list of these are the two thousand things, and they are like, okay, these most of this don't make sense, or like they are speaking different languages, and like you know things that cannot be justified. Like you know you have to compress those two thousand into like what is actionable, what is important, and what is being really used. Right. Uh, prioritizing you know, so and stuff. Prioritization. So that that uh, part has to be solved. You know, uh, for security to come into into, into this. Uh, there's definitely the other aspect is now the the supply chain security you know the the, the management of s bombs and understanding the 
the dependencies you're with your, you know, the, the other libraries that you're using in your code and, you know, attacking that. So that has to be, that also we believe the more and more you can shift left and build it part of your CI CD, the better, better it would be. So you, you, you're bringing as bomb, uh, features in the product. We, we are, we are, we will, will be, uh, launching capabilities around, around that. It's a median mm -hmm. company is trying to, to, to build as bomb stuff. Uh, but you had a you had a pretty unique um, approach to it, uh, which was you know g going going also all the way back to the source code. Uh, yes, so you know we we look obviously going all the way back to the source code, but our approach is a bit around like uh, the the generation of SBOM is getting uh, let's say pretty common and uh, you know in some ways commoditized, and the community and the industry has done a very good job and different approaches to to generate SBOMs. What the industry has not good job is the, is the orchestration of the workflow after that. Like what happens right after? You know, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you track all the S bombs? You're doing like hundreds of deployments a day. There are hundreds of different S bombs. Where do you track them? If a zero day vulnerability comes in, you know, how do you go and figure out like you know which deployments are 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 impacted like, or like where things are deployed? You know, through these kind of S bombs. We being the CI CD platform, we are doing the deployments. Like you know, we are doing all the deployments. We know what's deployed where. You know, it's uh, and so we so we can we can bring the we can close the loop on that we have a full you know uh, inventory of what was deployed you know uh, what version of a container or what version of some code was deployed where you know and mm -hmm. where, is, where is the current state of things and what are all the bombs behind what was generated so like if something comes in we can very quickly tell you you know these are the things that are they are deployed which has the the impact of this one vulnerability like the 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 lock for J uh, you know uh, last year that you know uh, where you know when everyone was scrambling to Okay, we're in our production system, so we might be impacted. You know, we we could, you know, if we if, if what the capabilities that we're building is the, the full orchestration of the life cycle around it. So there is never like you know, in, 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 in a minute you can do a query and tell like, okay, these are all the production systems and these deployments that happened with, you know, this is the history of deployments that happened with that particular S bomb which had this vulnerability uh, you know inside right. it, you know. So that's your 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 full list where you need to go and mitigate. Yeah, that that's huge. Uh you know, when when we had the log4j stack, I was very grateful that we had moved uh, uh, the orchestration to, to Kubernetes, and we were able not only to to use the admission controller to inject uh, hot patches to the containers we didn't not have a, a log4j patch uh, for yet from the from the vendor, uh, but we were also able to track and and add a, some type of ingress to it. You know, to to prevent uh, the exploitation of it. So so just having the ability to to be aware mm -hmm. of w what is where. And and of course, with uh, you know platform one, my team at, at DoD was the first one to push S bombs across mm -hmm. the, the the department and the the government. In fact, that's why the the White House wrote this S bomb and zero trust executive order. We uh, we kind of led the way when it came to uh, to zero trust and S bomb. So uh, definitely critical. So um, yeah, you 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 made claims before. Uh, and I'm I'm gonna ask you to back it up. Uh, mm -hmm. You said obviously you save time, but you you actually said publicly that you are the fastest CI on the planet. So mm -hmm. so how how do you how do you prove that? Well, the the, the proof is in the in the you know if it's, it's like any experiment. Like you know you you run the experiment and you show the data, and the data is publicly available for uh, for for everyone. Uh, so what we what what uh, what we have done is like if you go to harness.io uh, slash blog on our blog you will see all the data that's being uh, uh, you know that we have published around it like where we have taken some some common open source projects like you know apache kafka or like you know and and you can see the the commit history of these projects and like you know then we go and replay the commit history and so okay if, if you are doing the the you know the, the the build on a ci with harness versus something else what 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 would it take uh, so we we uh, we have uh, published data against you know GitHub Actions and Circle CI and Jenkins and like the common CI and it's 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 very open data and open test like anyone can go and run it like you know you can you can run the test yourself and see how how long it takes so we you know we 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 looked at like say if you look at Apache Kafka and you run the the previous uh, you know uh, commits that have happened with with us versus a say a, you know GitHub Actions you will see about like you know somewhere around five to five to eight x improvement like you know what yeah so it takes about two to three minutes to run in, in harness and it takes about like you know 20 25 minutes to run in in in, in say github actions 
You know, same thing applies for other other CI systems as well. So when we make the claim that we are the fastest CI on the on, on the planet, we we really back it up with data that you can go and take you know take some some repo and you know and and run real tests and which you publish them and and compare. You know, and the impact. If you look at the developer experience impact, like you know the waiting for builds is the is 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 one of the most uh, you know important things that frustrate developers. Like you know that I made a code change and my waiting for my build to complete and it's going to take thirty minutes or two hours. You know, and you know if you can bring it down from like thirty minutes to five minutes or six minutes, or from two hours down to like you know uh, thirty minutes, it's a big big uh, impact on developer experience, right? So now the people ask the question, hey, how did you achieve it? It like, seems like you know magic. Like how did you achieve this this uh, this, right? So the, yes, there is a lot of innovation that has gone into it. Like you know one of the innovations I talked about, test intelligence, because a big part of the the, the in in CI is running tests. So, like you compile the code and you run tests. And you know, uh, as I said, like you know, almost every CI in the any every, actually every CI in the world, there is no intelligence about running tests. Like you know, you you there, you, have a, you have a suite of tests and you run them all, and there is no there is no like intelligent ordering into them. There is no intelligent like you know figuring out like what tests are really useful versus not for the code change that just happened. So we brought in a lot of intelligence. So where we we are learning creating these learning models on like you know uh, which is like what part of code like you had all the dependency of every single class and every single function in the code. You know, on on what tests are are going to be you know uh, correlated with that that part of the code, right? So when when some code change, changes, we know like you know out of the three thousand tests, these are the three hundred that needed to be run, and even out out of those three hundred, this is the order we should run so it fail fast. Like you know, if you you run the the test that's probably the most likely to fail, you run that first. So if you fail, you don't need to wait for if the first test fail and your build fails, you don't need to wait for the other other tests to to do right. So a lot of that intelligence is a, is a key part of it. And the second a technique that we brought in, what we call cache intelligence, you know, which is about how do you intelligently cache the dependencies, the you know, the different, you know, the libraries, the containers, so you don't have to download the right kind of things. So the caching itself, you know, uh, you know, with and uh, with a lot of intelligence around caching, uh, you know, uh, makes it much faster on 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 how your CI runs. And then the, that, and then there's a third part, which is which is really about optimizing the the infrastructure, like you know, the hardware that you will run your your, your builds on. How do you do in the right kind of parallelism? You know, if you have, you know, if can we can we break your, you know, let's say if you have to run 300 tests and you are you have to compile multiple things, can we break it and run into like you know 10 different parallel, uh, uh, you know, processes so things are running in parallel so we can we, we can we, we 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 can do that better. So we, there's a lot of optimization and and work that we have done uh, to solve the the problem around. But how do we how do we how do we be the you know make builds to go faster? How do we go CI to go faster? So that's 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 what we had it. You know, anyone on listening here? If you don't believe it, it sounds like you know too good to be true that we are three x five x faster. You know, go and go to our website harness.io. You know, uh, sign up for our CI and and try it yourself. Like, take some code repo, you know, build it with whatever your current CI is. You know, take the same code repo and build with with harness CI, and you will see the see, see, see the difference yourself. And it will take you like you know maybe thirty minutes to uh, to do to do that all. Yeah, that, that, you know, it's funny because yesterday I was actually uh, testing a, a GitHub action uh, for Node.js app. It took like an hour and I'm like, wow, you know, this is so slow. Mm -hmm. And you look at the default template of GitHub action, they don't even zip the, the code. So so it's sending it, you know, unzip file by file. It took forever. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, publishing the artifacts could took forever. Even even VS Code is doing this better mm -hmm. uh, natively. So uh, obviously uh, they put the ball pretty low. <laughs> optimizations uh, but yeah you know i think uh, that, that's where we look at like there's a lot of room for innovation like you know sometimes these things are like you know it's not like one massive breakthrough like you know you also look at like you know things. Tuning, yeah, tuning, know. optimizing like you know a lot of different things so that you, the, you, you can create like the three x five x you know in 10 x in some cases faster um, uh, ci for people yeah, and so I had to Google. Uh, well, actually, I used the bot to ask the question, mm -hmm. and and the bot gave me the code, the YAML code, to zip mm -hmm. the files uh, before and after, you know, and uh, it went down to five minutes instead of one hour. So just that little, mm -hmm. uh, you know, change, and and the default template that you get get uh, going to GitHub is not giving you that that mm -hmm. that code, which I find to be mind boggling. But um, anyway, that's a good example of uh, you know mm -hmm. how you can drastically improve life. So we talk about Elon Musk, but um, what's so obviously you're touching uh, uh, a lot of pieces, and you know one of the critic of of, of uh, GitLab is like, oh, you you know you're doing a lot of things, but you're not doing it too well. So you like in on the average, you know, a GitLab is like the average of everything, but they don't 
really have you know deep expertise when you start looking at their feature stuff for example feature flag stuff it's, it's pretty basic right you look at uh, their cd stuff it's kind of the same thing right uh the, the git stuff obviously their foundation so it's actually very good um how do you make sure that's not what happened to, how do you decide when you know you say oh maybe we're gonna have to look into source code one day right because that's part of GitOps and it's important uh, it's a crown jewel plus you know if you look at dod use case right people buy gitlab ultimate or premium uh because we need to have a hosted git repo right we cannot use uh, github.com or gitlab.com so they buy that and then you know they use gitlab ci because it's part of the price so now you know for you guys to come and say well you know we have a better ci we're going to save you time well okay but you're not bringing git with you so we still have to buy git gitlab so now they they would have to justify well you know i'm going to pay two products now right uh and uh you know and 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 so it's an expense pretty had big heavy expense compared to just buying one um creates more complexity more you know more whatever so when you decide what's next and when you decide you have you're good enough in one of these uh, kind of um, vertical and before you move to the next one yeah i think that's a that's a great question and, you know our, our philosophy is very different on on this you know our philosophy is good enough is not good enough it's you have to be you have to be you have to be great at each of these before you move to other things like so we that's one. a part we set for ourselves so also a part of it is like how we internally organize our teams around it you know we organize our teams what we call them like startups within a startup so harness is a startup right and each of these are like almost like running as uh, their own startups with their own charter to innovate and the the, the the charter to innovate comes to like you know can we be the best in doing it and what does the best mean you start with the first principles right so the in ci the best is fastest builds you know uh, which is what the developers want in cd it's the it's the most secure reliable automated deployments you know which is what the you know the the, the devops teams want in feature flags it's like the you know the the most scalable feature flags uh, you know with the, with the with the right amount of flexibility around managing feature flags when you look at cloud cost management which is like the most we think that the best, the, the the definition of best now in cloud cost management is around around automating the cloud cost management, not just giving, showing you where the cloud. Just cost telling is, you, not telling you you're wasting money, but fixing it. Yeah. So so we look at like we want to push ourselves to the best in 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 each of the areas that we build, and that's we won't stop until we become best, and we keep going into into innovating and iterating on it. So it's a, it's a very different philosophy. So we don't believe in good enough and the you know. The value is in the integrated platform. We look at yes, the integrated platform is great, you know, and there's a lot of value into it. But each of our areas have to be best in class as well, and that's how we we that's what our our, our philosophy on this is. Uh, yes, so so you know, uh, we 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 want to expand o over time into other areas, and we'll continue to, but not at the cost of you know that we have sort of good enough things or in in areas. You know, the reality is people don't use them. Like you know, you they use the Git, you use the GitLab example. You know. Uh, you know they have few good products like you know their source code management is great and the ci is is, is is good and people use them but if you said their feature flags or cd or apm or logs they're if they're not great people don't use them even if they're packaged as one bundle it's you still have to put a lot of effort to make them work like so you know we see that yeah we see like you know ultimately as, as a user if there is something that's packaged out of a big bundle but it's not good enough it's not great you will have to put the manual work of making it work, you know, and so the cost, it will cost you much more, you know, so it's like say, yeah, so it, ultimately the, the cost, you are incurring the cost, maybe not in the license. And you just don't human, realize it is the cost the, the is still cost. there. Yes. So when we look at like say our CI, let's yes, like, you know, you may be paying for CI already, like separately, you know, to you're paying for your source code management to someone and CI to, to us. But if your CI is 5x faster, look at the developer saving cost. Like you know, right. would the the the, 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 the cost, and all that. license cost of like you know what you have to pay there will be like almost yeah, it's, it's anecdotal. It's yeah. anecdotal. So, so I would say that is the case that people have to make and look at it. Like you know, okay, is, can but people we, don't think that way. We need to tell them to to do that, right? They they need to to start doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so, so 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 that's 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 the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's the philosophy uh, it mm -hmm. takes 10 minutes to look into the VPN and just start the laptop because they, they don't use S SSD drives, right? So it's legacy machines. Um, and we had to go and say, hey, look, you know, you're wasting, you know, a thousand hours per whatever, you know, per month. What I forgot the number was, but it's 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 billions, right? And they're like, well, the laptop costs, you know, maybe 50 million, right? And you're wasting billions. You know, it's, it's just always interesting how 
of productivity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people don't, don't track it. You, you, you made an announcement uh, today, I, I believe, yeah. uh, about Propello, right? Is that the name, if I'm not yes, mistaken? Propello, yeah. your part? Exactly. Uh -huh. I, I never heard of them before, so I, I don't know much about what they do. So can you tell us a little bit why sure. you, you thought you would buy them? Yeah, you know, uh, that's that's the breaking news that we have today. So uh, uh, good good timing for that. Uh, a big part of the you know, the software delivery process is the challenge is that people don't know what's going on. Like, you know, there are no insights into, inside the process. Like, you know, even simple things like Dora metrics. You know, for someone to pull out, like, you know, what your Dora metrics are, like, you know, which is like Dora metrics, as you know, are the... The deployment frequency, the change failure rate, the you know mean time to recover, uh, you know your 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 um, uh, lead time to uh, you know to, to to ship things. F tracking those and measuring them is hard. Like the instrumenting your software delivery process is very hard. And you know yeah. we see the organizations with like you know you have two thousand developers, five thousand developers, ten thousand developers, and someone like you know people are like okay, what do my ten thousand developers really do? And which areas are inefficient? Like where are they waiting on like you know? Are they waiting on approvals? Are they waiting on builds? Are they waiting on like, you know, that, the, that these particular teams have slow, low deployment frequency and these teams have high change failure rate and they're spending too much time on troubleshooting things. There is no visibility. And the visib lack of visibility is a key part of why we have so many, so much, you know, inefficiencies, right? So, you know, the, 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 the old software engineering uh, thing, like, you know, what you can't measure, you can't fix, you can't improve. So if you want to if you improve your software delivery lifecycle and the, the software delivery process, you have to measure it all. And that's what we wanted to, to bring in into the Harness platform. Like, you know, that we want to, you know, create this, you know, new next generation software delivery uh, for you, which is like everything automated CI, automated CD, feature flags, cloud cost management, governance, chaos engineering, all of it. But how do you measure the before? How do you measure this the after? How do you measure like, you know, what impact is happening? And that's what this company Propello does. You know, what, what they do is, uh, uh, you know, they integrate with almost everything that you will have in your DevOps ecosystem from like your CI things to your, you know, uh, source code management, your ticketing systems like Jira or whatever you have, to your you know your uh, uh, deployment, pager duty, incident management, APM. So about like you know 40, 50 different uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know systems in your in your DevOps developer ecosystem. They will integrate with them all and pull in data into like this very consistent data model. That consistent data model is defining now like you know uh, starting from like it, it starts all the way from the the ticket in Jira, like where someone says, okay, this is the feature we want to build, Jira or whatever system you will have, uh, you know, that these are the feature we want to build. Like what happens in the life cycle after that? Like, you know, from the feature, you know, how, how long it takes for that to be approved before people, the developer starts coding, how long it takes to code, what it takes after the coding from like the PR review to the, you know, the approvals and the, you know, how does the commit process work? And when the code is, check, is, 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 is committed, what happens on the building and testing side of it? You know, once the it builds and tests, what happens on the deployment side of it? Once it's deployed, what happens on the production side of it? Like, you know, are, is it causing incidents? If it's an incident, how how long it takes for you to, to resolve that? So there's an entire life cycle of like, you know, what, when you when you do something around around any any software any software requirement, and that entire life cycle, you know, is hard to track. What 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 uh, this product Propello does is to automate all of that. That you bring it brings all this data. And, and 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 adds to like a data model around like you know what what does the entire life cycle look like right so now you can slice and dice the data and have all kind of visibility inside you know you know which teams have you know inefficiencies at which part of that life cycle where where your issues are stuck right now where things take more time you know which teams are you know have, have you know are good on on each aspect of the you know the, the productivity for you know for for their delivery process for their for, for their developers and all of that is automated you can have like a a lot of dashboards and reports and visibility at, at at every different level, like you know, at the uh, and 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 tune what's what's wrong in your in your software delivery process, where you can find more efficiencies. So that visibility and reporting is what what you know uh, what what it provides. We we it will be a module on Harness platform, very completely you know uh, completely integrated into the seamlessly integrated into the platform. We're calling it Software Engineering Insights, you know, which is that the mm. that you want the insights into your software engineering, and that's lacking. Like you know, it's the, the you know almost any anywhere like you know. I find it actually very, almost very uh, uh, ironic that you know I, I go into like you know I'm also an investor, right? So I go into board meetings, etc. When you go into a board meeting, like you know, say a, a, like a tech company startup board meeting, to the your head of sales, your VP of sales, they come in with like full dashboards and reports on everything, you know, and everything and very, very measured and <laughs> instrumented. You know, your VP of marketing will comes in and say like dashboards and reports and everything is instrumented and measured. Even your finance VP of finance will come in and you know CFO and say. These are the dashboard reports, analytics, data charts on everything. 
your head of engineering comes in <laughs> there is no dashboard report chart something with a slide yeah the slide come on <laughs> and you think engineering should be the most instrumented but it's the least right. instrumented because it's been so hard to instrument and measure and track and to yeah. me that's a big part of why we have so many inefficiencies around software engineering so we so we we are very focused on let's 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 measure it and instrument what happens in your software engineering processes and give people the data and visibility around you know everything from the every every phase of it like which is the what happens from the you know when you have the issue, the issue life cycle from the beginning to like the coding process of it to the testing and building process of it to the deployment to the post deployment and bring it all together into this kind of visibility and telemetry around 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 around, around, around what what happens and that's that's what what our software engineering insights uh, module would be it's a, it's 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 you know uh, the, uh, this company propello the founding team came out of uh, palo alto networks you know they were running the engineering uh, at palo alto networks and they saw the problems at you know running their own engineering there and they you know, not having visibility there so they they started this 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 platform you know very uh, you know very very uh, strong product uh, and running in some very you know large uh, uh organizations financial services etc and we want to bring it into harness platform integrate it completely into our platform and and bring it to bring it to the market so how many people they have how big are they uh it, it's it's a small startup about about uh, about 35 40 people wow ah, okay well that was a good acquisition no doubt uh, i never heard of them before so now i'm gonna have to take a look at it mm -hmm. uh very cool it's i, I don't know of any competitor uh, that they would have uh, no, nothing like that at least i don't know of any, any yeah problem. you know that market is, is is still at in the early stages some people call it like the value stream management and starting to evolve into that value yeah. stream, you know, concept and we look at value stream is one way to slice the, the 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 life cycle of what's happening but there you know a lot of people look at it like you know by particular what it, what features you are building you know uh, by different teams by different organizations different business units different departments they're all different ways you want to organize and learn for for this data but that it's mm -hmm. it's really not not too much too, not too much um, you know good innovation to understand your end to end stlc and that's that's what we 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 wanted to bring in yeah no, that's awesome um so obviously you talk about uh, uh you know some of the uh capabilities of of the cloud cost products mm -hmm. you, you kind of answered a little bit the question but but what can you actually do to help with the it's not just giving insights of where the money is being spent you're saying you're also looking at automating and making almost like runtime changes to some assets to save money yeah uh, that that is when we look at cloud cost management you know if, you know and if you look at the history of cloud cost management it's all about visibility like you know you pull in data from nc you have like uh, reports and dashboards and where the cloud cost is spent right and then someone will look at the data and then they will go and yell at the developers and say hey your cloud cost well went up here go and do something about it and the developers will go and try to troubleshoot it and maybe try to bring it down and fix it somewhere uh, we want to automate that process to be like that just doesn't scale like you know i've seen in so many organizations where like once a month some report comes out you know the and the 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 cost people who are looking at the cloud cost bill they say the the bill bill is going up let's do something about it and then people will go and do something it's just too slow and that you see the right, yeah. the 40 50 60% waste maybe 70 80% waste in many cases is because of that so we look at the the next level of innovation in cloud cost management is automation like real real automation like uh, where so we what we have brought into the market a few techniques on already on automation like obviously you're doing very good job at the visibility side like you know what is it's almost like table stakes on like getting all the data visibility and actually we do much better than many of the existing players by very going very deep in the kubernetes side of visibility that you know if you, if you are running in kubernetes like most of the historical cloud cost management uh, products were not very deep on kubernetes we I do, don't know cloud native it's mostly vms and that you know cloud exactly, services. exactly so we and we go all the way down to like you know the pod level namespace level you know everything oh, wow. at every level like you know we can we can allow you to understand you know what's happening on your kubernetes cost how do you optimize it how do you how do, how do you tune it how do you fix it right but that's the so that's on the visibility side like you know where we say okay what is broken in the visibility let's fix that which is mostly around you know more flexible reporting going deeper into kubernetes but that to me is like just the the, the almost the first chapter of it like you know the 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 cloud cost management it can only be fixed by true automation right so when we look at automation we look at like okay, what are the different problems right so one is that your dev and test in most environments about 50 to 60 percent of the cloud cost could be dev and test and you would think like you know most of my cost should be in production but you know it's, it's kind of strange that you know it's the the dev and test environments take up so much of the cloud cost 
And most of the dev and test machines are, are really not used all the time. Like, you know, your developer would say, okay, I have these three machines that I use to run, you know, my test. Uh, that those three machines, machines are probably used like three hours in a, in a, in a, in, you know, you know, in, in a week or maybe six hours in a week, but they don't want to bring them down because it's, there's effort to bring them back up. Like, so yeah, they're, yeah. Uh, so what we have brought in this, what we call like a, a, a technical intelligent auto stopping. What it does is like, you know, you put a, like a, this kind of a small intelligent proxy in front of all of these, the dev and test machines you have. And the traffic is going through, through through that, you know, no no impact on the traffic there. But then we look at okay, there is for two minutes there is no traffic. We'll put those machines to kind of sleep, right? So you you don't incur cost on it. And if there is new traffic, they come back again automatically. So the developers don't have to do anything. So now if you're running it, the machine the machines are only really used for like you know six hours in a week. You're really only paying for six hours in a week. But the developer experience is not bad. Like they they have the machine when they need it. It just automatically comes comes back up. So, you know, we, and we are seeing like, you know, you know, 50, 60% saving on the dev and test environments with this, you know, intelligent auto stopping wow. uh, 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 kind, of, kind, of, kind of technique, for you know, for example. You know, it, it's very similar to what I, I like to call it, like the motion sensing lights, which seems like a simple yeah, concept. Same thing. Right? You don't want to have the light on all night. Yeah, you know, same go, go in the room, the light comes back, you know, uh, comes, uh, you know uh, comes up, you know, you go out, you know, there's no motion for two minutes and the lights go, go off. It's, that's yeah. what we brought in for this. Same concept. So then we brought in a good amount of innovation and techniques for the production side of things, you know, which is the, you know, one is the spot instance orchestration, you know, how do you automate the spot instance orchestration to, and to, to cut down the cost, you know, we, uh, the, the kind of the, the intelligent management of your clusters, your Kubernetes clusters, you know, auto scaling around them in a more intelligent way. Uh, we are also about to bring in a, bring in a concept around, uh, around, um, you know, management of your reserved instances, like, you know, if you have the, uh, how, how do you optimize, like, you know, automatic uh, uh, allocation of what reserved instances you would need, you know, so that, because many times you, you can save a lot of money by, by paying for reserved instances, but you don't know which reserved instances to have, you know, and, uh, and so there, there's, there, there is, there is, there is, there is automation that can solve those, like, you know, when you need mm. reserved instances that can go and trade the, you know, and exchange the, you know, the reserved instances that you bought, so you can, you know, we, we see like, you know, each of these techniques, you know, you can save like 10%, 15% cost, 5% cost, 10%, depending on what your situation, how you're using. But we what we are focusing on is a lot of innovation on, can we automate more and more of the waste? Like, you know, the, the, the waste reduction just automatically happens. So you don't have to worry about like, you know, someone is looking at the report and then telling people what to do and they go and fix it. And a month later, it's still the same problem or something else. Then how can you automate more and more of the, the waste reduction? And we are, we are seeing, a, you know, a, you know, a, a, you know, a lot of impact on it. Like, you know, it's the, the it, and it's kind of like so strange that 40, 50, 60 percent waste is there everywhere. Like, you know, it's like that's yeah. the you know, you would think like people would have figured it out and the cloud cost is so high. So people would put some, a lot of focus into it. It's, 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 it's industry-wide challenge right now. Like, you know, that the, there's so much waste in the cloud. The cloud providers must not like you too much. They, they, they have their <laughs> tools, but they, they're, they're doing it on purpose not to make it too good because it's kind of a conflict of interest for them, right? There, there, there is yes, but you know, all of you know, uh, if the, I was in the AWS, uh, you know, the, their conference, and they, they, they publicly claim they said they accepted it that about fifty percent of the cloud cost is waste. So they know that that's a that's a problem, <laughs> you know, and they accept it. So to their credit, it's not a problem for them. That's a problem for us, but not for them. Right? It's it's a good it's good for business uh, for their business. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so you mentioned that you're also touching uh, chaos engineering. Can you can you tell the audience, we have a video on chaos engineering, I'll put the link, but tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about, um, you know, what mm -hmm. it is and, and what you do uh, in, in chaos. Yeah, you know, ultimately chaos engineering is about increasing resiliency of your systems, right? You know, the resiliency is, if something goes wrong, are your system resilient enough to keep up with, you know, with something that went wrong? The, the practice was uh, almost uh, pioneered uh, by Netflix, uh, I would say maybe six, seven, eight years ago now. And, uh, you know, and their primary thesis was like, you know, things go wrong all the time. So the only way you become resilient is by testing for, you know, what happens when things go wrong. So, you know, they, so they, 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 they created something called chaos monkey at that time, which was like, this was like something that will go and randomly just shut down instances in, in the cloud. Like, you know, they were running in, uh, you know, AMIs in, in, in AWS and they will just randomly shut down and see, you know, do the, is the system resilient for that? So a lot of the chaos engineering is, you know, I would call it resiliency testing. Like, are you testing uh, for resiliency that when things go wrong, what happens? So what yeah. what what we brought in at Harness is uh, uh, is, is is you know is a capability for chaos engineering, but with the also the focus on like you know can we 
integrate that into your ci cd processes as well so before you ship your changes can you run those resiliency tests and you know what we call experiments resiliency experiments and you know before you go into production you know so uh, so you can catch some of those problems in your pre pre production staging kind of environments and that's integrated in as part of those control gates in your in 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 the, in the pipelines like we talked about the guardrails and the you know and the and the checks and balances that are automated in the pipelines resiliency uh, testing and the guardrails around that could automate be automated in the pipeline as well many times you can also run in production you know many people are uncomfortable running in production but you know and we we totally understand that and say start with running these resiliency tests in staging environments first and you don't need to run in production but you know sometimes you can bring them to production all the all the way to production as well at harness we acquired a project called litmus chaos litmus chaos is a very popular chaos engineering project is actually the the only cncf project uh, for chaos engineering so the the team that in, that built litmus chaos we brought them as part of the harness family and now it's the, and then we build sort of a enterprise uh, secure you know a uh, grade uh, secure uh, kind of offering around litmus chaos which is as as the harness chaos engineering module which is part of our uh, uh, part of our harness platform uh, people run a lot of resiliency tests you know on, on those you know which is like tests around like you know what happens if uh, you know if you if you shut down something in a kubernetes cluster you know or the network connection between you know things go uh, you go off like you know so what you're what you're what you're simulating in these resiliency tests is those failures like network failures you know system failures you know if you're if you have two microservices what happens if the microservice one cannot talk to microservice two would you still would your system will still survive you know uh, so you know so what what we would do in that case when you run the experiment you know you're blocking the network traffic automatically uh to to so that the microservice one cannot talk to microservice two and you know on, on like you know on one path and so do you have a failover built in in your in your system do you have some caching mechanism built in you know uh you know though are you resilient for those kind of failures is what what you are you are you are ultimately testing uh there is an interesting uh, you know uh discussion actually we have going on in our company you know we are doing it uh, which is people some people say now chaos engineering has a negative connotation ultimately it's about resilience so should we call it resilience engineering and you know, actually, I would love to hear your opinion. Like, you know, uh, is 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 it uh, is 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 it uh, better to explain in terms of resiliency engineering, or is it uh, better to explain as chaos engineering? Well, there's pros and cons on both sides. I think you know the 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 whole point of chaos is to say, look, we we're gonna we're gonna be willing to uh, you know do that to to production systems, right? And, oh, in DoD, it was always a pretty big pushback, and so we had to always explain mm -hmm. it. It creates a little bit of a challenge, but it's also like a waking up moment of like, hey, you should be comfortable enough and have with res res the resiliency uh, baked in to be confident that it's not going to be chaos. So, so I think it's it's kind of a you know kind of a, a way to wake people up a little bit. I get the point. You know, I think there's a whole debate. Uh, I think that my my fear now is uh, if if a single company or even two or three companies mm -hmm. start renaming things, then it's going to create uh you know kind of confusion uh, in the in the market landscape but uh you know I, I, it might be a little late for that now i guess uh it, it can kind of became mainstream mm -hmm. so I, I kind of like now chaos engineering but but you know I, for sure you can tell particularly in in you know nuclear safety and mm -hmm. uh air worldliness uh teams uh the, the chaos piece i mean you can't obviously crash a plane and right so you know, people will always uh, overreact, right? But but that was a good exercise for me to actually flip it on its head and tell people, well, yeah, but, you know, the, the whole point is to do it proactively uh, in a controlled fashion so it doesn't end up like chaos. But, but you know, you know, it, it takes a, a certain level of, of maturity in DevSecOps to get there, right? So, yeah, I mean, for sure in the, in the marketing, you could certainly still use resiliency as a, as a primary selling point, but I... I would hesitate renaming the category as a whole. I guess yeah, that, that makes sense, and that's kind of the the the, the debate that we were having as well. <laughs> the, 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 you know, it's it, you know people, as you said, like people need a certain degree of maturity in their DevOps and DevSecOps to be comfortable. Oh, yes. with, uh, you know, even uh, talking about it. Something yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah, but you know, it's like anything in life. You always uh, get more mature and. Uh, and uh, ideally you keep learning and uh, that's why we created learn with nick because we want to you know have people uh, always learn so mm -hmm. um so obviously you know harness and and even traceable right um has a pretty um, important focus on the federal market mm -hmm. um obviously 
the federal market is slow. I mean, mm -hmm. at the same time, the you know the nation matters, and we want to have the access to the best tools mm -hmm. uh, for not only the the, the war fighters, but even like the other uh, civilian agencies as well. Mm -hmm. um, what made you focus on on the on that market? Well, you know, there's a lot of interesting software engineering work happening in the in the in the federal space. You know, your defense agencies and the civilian agencies on both sides of it. And uh, we look at look, if, if we have to solve problems for where the complex software uh, engineering is happening, federal market is a, is, a, is a very important market for us. Uh, you know, there also just from a from a financial perspective, if you look at the data points, uh, uh, you know, which we hear anecdotally, you know, I, I don't it's think. Lots uh, of money. Uh, Amazon publishes it, but about 15% of the AWS spend is in the Gov Cloud or something like that, right? So if you can see, that's a very, very significant portion of uh, you know of where the cloud spending is happening, which is a proxy for where the cloud native you know software engineering is happening, you know. And so that's a that's a there's definitely a you know uh, uh, it's 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 a large interesting market to solve these problems. But when we look at like you know the the core of the problems we are solving are all. You know, uh, become DevSecOps. Like, how do you do, de you know, uh, fast software engineering in a very secure and compliant manner? And that's, uh, you know, the, the the government is has a high degree of responsibility. You know, if you go look in the defense agencies, you are talking about nuclear systems and you know, uh, and, and fighter airplanes, and you, you can you you have to be extremely extremely secure. But at the same time, there is value for innovation. Like, you know, if you if you get to like you know that you are very secure, but your innovation velocity is very low. That's a, that there's impact on everyone, you know, impact on, you know, eventually national security that we are not innovative fast enough when when need to be, you know, so ideally it would be great if like, you know, you can do high degree of, you know, innovation, very fast innovation, but there is no, they're all the, 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 the safety and security and, you know, is built in in a true DevSecOps manner, that would be great. And so we see like, you know, for both harness and traceable, you know, traceable with API security, you know, modern application security and, Kind of the modern DevSecOps, uh, CI/CD, and all 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 the tooling, both are very very applicable in the in the in the in the in the federal market, federal space. So that's why we are very committed to, uh, you know, to investing and uh, and 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 bringing the right solution to the federal space. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because what what scares me a little bit is you see a lot of new startups, right, uh, refusing to do business uh, with mm -hmm. the government, particularly uh, the Department of Defense. Often, you know, people born here, uh, you know, that are not like you and me, uh, immigrants, uh, kind of uh, got to not, uh, you know, support their own country, which is always pretty scary to me. Um, mm. But you know, th then uh, immigrants like us, I guess, we, we see the value and 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 we want to make sure that uh, you know the the taxpayer and the war fighters that sacrifices their lives uh, have the the best tools to get the job done, often okay. more more securely. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, we, 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 we came here as immigrants because we believe in the in, in America as, as 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 a country and like you know what could be uh, you know so I, I think a lot of innovation that's happening in securing the country as a, as, as as startups and tech companies we have to support that so we, we are we are strong strong believers uh, in bringing the best technology best innovation to to support our our, our defense ecosystem and and uh, for, for the country. And the other piece also for, for, you know, entrepreneurs, obviously, that, that you, I'm sure you see a lot of them with your VC hat, like I used to do. Um, the, the fact is during a recession, like we are facing, the, the government money is not going anywhere, right? So, so it's a pretty yeah. safe market. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the only thing is like, you know, it's, it's slower moving than like say so, the industry, but that's fine. Like, you know, we, but, once you have it though, it, you have, yeah. it, you know, from our perspective, we look at like you know we are doing it. We're not doing it for the short term. We are doing it for the long term. We are building okay, a platform exactly. for for this for the next you know uh, next ten years even longer. You know so yes, it's it it takes it takes a bit time like the decision making process and the the you know the budgeting process, approval process, all of that could be slower than like you know in the than on the commercial side. But that's 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 totally fine. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so I guess talk. Quickly, you know, I mean, you have your VC hat. You, you, you know, you know the drill. You know what's going on. You've done multiple acquisition, uh, obviously, uh, recently. Uh, what do you see are the challenges with the current economy? For co what, what should people pay attention to? I guess. You know, the I think the number one thing is obviously we are in that economic cycle where we'll see a slowdown. There is no, 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 no doubt about it. You know, from the where the the interest rates are, uh, it's all. 
the, the cycle of you know high inflation causing high interest rates high interest rate means less investment in the businesses and the economy which means slow down uh, in the in the economy and some of it is 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 i would think is probably needed because the the you know there was the uh, too, too much too much too much money in the in the economy and causing some some froth in the economy so but but we'll have a slowdown so it, it's very clear what we are seeing is the, the the tech side of the economy has a has a has a higher or a faster slowdown than the the other aspects of it like you know if you look at finance and retail and you know and you know entertainment there is not as much slowdown yet uh, but on the tech side there is there is, there, is, there is a bit more but a part of the slowdown is driven by the the stock markets and you know how the stock markets used to value the tech companies you know so so there is some part which is like the slowdown on the tech side you know if you look at if you talk to like silicon valley tech startups you know it's 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 uh, it's uh, i would say the impact of the economy is much higher than almost any other industry right now but a big part of it that is the the valuations you know the you know we, we had like this last 3 4 5 years of extremely high valuations in the in the stock markets for high growth tech companies so those valuations came down like 50 60 70% and now that that starts to impact like you know the everything that's happening in the venture capital ecosystem you know how the private companies by, are valued by vcs you know and now it's like you know the companies uh, have a challenge raising capital at the the valuations that they were raising in the in, in the past so that's causing a lot of like the 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 the, the, the combination of that is causing significant impact on the on, on the on, on the the tech startup startup space i would say some of that is actually healthy in some ways because sometimes when there is like too much froth of the 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 the, the capital in the market you know it, it, it uh, companies don't force uh, themselves to be very efficient or to be very innovative or very differentiated you know so it, it creates an opportunity as well but that said i do think like you know there is a there 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 is there's a bit of an adjustment that that goes in there in if i look in the macro sense like you know 3 years 5 years uh, you know kind of sense you know it it's it won't really make a difference like you know to the to the companies that are building good products good offerings good solutions they will emerge out of you know any kind of the the economic uh, you know a downturn or slowdowns you know stronger you know most good companies tech companies if you look at it they they gone through recession cycles and they were they came out of it stronger whether you look at a google or you know any anyone from amazon like you know amazon almost died in the you know the 99 2000 you know but then came out to be much much stronger from it so i i do think that's that's uh, uh, from that sense it's then the long term it's it's not going to really make an impact but short term there is definitely for the you know uh, in 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 the tech ecosystem there's a there's a big impact of the the you know the economy a big part of it is driven by the stock market uh, multiples of the companies and less of the economy itself you know it's the it's uh, but the but the the impact is real do, do, do you think that the vcs were a big part of the problem the, the valuation they were giving to some of these companies on a napkin was completely <laughs> insane uh, y- yes i would say you know and i, I also have a vc head uh, as well <laughs> right. but i would i would say yes you know vcs were uh, part of this uh, of, of the problem that the valuations were very high for a lot of companies but also the public I mean, market. they would go public and then they would crash down because they couldn't even sustain the valuation on the public market right yes yes but i would say that even the public market investors were uh, were were looking at when the interest rates were low they were looking for where the the growth is the most high in the tech right. sector is where the growth is the most high like you know you it, there are not too many industries where companies are growing like you know 40% 50% 60% year over year like you know if you right. in most industries if your business is growing like 5% year over year that's You're that's really happy yeah. you know so so the the public markets were when the interest rates were very low they were saying you know they will they will value the you know all the high growth companies and they were lo- looking at okay if your business is inefficient and you're growing at high will pay you significantly high and the, you know there was no one was caring about about pe ratio there were no profits and all of those so a lot of the vc behavior is also driven by the public market behavior so i won't blame completely the vcs i'll also look yeah. at like how the public markets were valuing the tech companies and the growth companies in a low interest rate environment in high interest rate environment they the, the math completely changes for them and then that 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 math has to change for the vcs as well at some point yeah no doubt no doubt um so i guess you know everybody is wondering how you manage all this stuff and you have the vc and you have all this stuff and you manage to do all this and and still survive so how do you do that <laughs> i guess um uh, you know i i would say the 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 number one thing is you know you have to you have to like what you're doing like you know it's uh, if you don't like what you're doing passion. yeah passion yeah yeah you have to have passion for it like you know if you're doing it as uh, as it's it's just a job 
it's hard to hard, hard to wear those hats and do do those things and if you have passion about these problems you know and you know for some people these pro problems might be boring for me these problems are I'm, you know they 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 interest me and they excite me that you know how can we increase the developer productivity you know can we increase the well the innovation velocity for the whole world by by cutting down 30 40 percent waste from developers you know that's an exciting problem that i'm very passionate about so that allows you to allows you to do that i would say the second part is is the right people right you know you can't do it alone like you know and there's nothing right. of, of importance you can do alone so you know can you bring the right people to be part of a journey people who could you know uh you know uh become strong partners with you to do uh you know a uh, uh, lot of lot of the work together with you that's very key for for, for you to scale and you know I, I put a lot of focus and attention on that you know the third is like you know i unfortunately i don't have too many uh, hobbies this is what i like to do so this is kind yeah, of that's your hobby, hobby i guess right yes yeah. like, you know sometimes people are like why don't you play golf is like yeah it's like you know and this is what i like yeah, to do yeah. I, you know I, i'm glad i don't have golf as a hobby yet <laughs> yep no I, I i'm kind of the same way so i understand um, so last question before we, uh, you know, we're out of time, but I'm going to ask you one, one, one question from the public at least, because so many people ask questions, but what, what keeps you up at night? Uh, well, you know, I sleep very well. Like, you know, people, people think I have these and I won't, I'm doing all these things and I won't be sleeping. You know, I think sleep is key. I, I actually believe in, in good sleep. Uh, yeah. but you know, obviously, uh, you know, you have to make sure your, your, your business is doing well, you know, and there are always things that, that come in, like, you know, where, you know, you you may have uh, um, you know challenges from a you know uh, you know what if something happens in economy or something happens in you know with some of your key customers or key employees, competitors, all sort of things happen. But yeah. you know, you don't. You, there's no point losing sleep on it. Like you know, I look at like you know, I I only I only to me it's like there's, some, there's something that I cannot control. No point worrying about it. If there is something I can control, no point worrying about it. You go fix it. Like why worry about it? Just go and act on it. So you know, if you just keep right. worrying about something and like you know, what's the point? So you know, that's that's kind of my philosophy on that. Yeah, that makes sense. It's better that way anyway. So uh, one question from the public. Um, he was asking about uh, the 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 CD uh, security challenges. He said in in the closed side. I assume I don't know if you know what that means. I assume that means the the the, the classified side or. Mm -hmm. when when the cd environment is is disconnected from or air gapped let's say mm -hmm. I, I think that's what he means unless you know what that means but yeah so you know from from a harness perspective we bring our platform in a fully air gapped environment so you know if you mm -hmm. if you want to run your cd pipelines in a fully closed air gapped environment nothing nothing connecting to the cloud nothing connecting to you know any any external systems you can you can fully uh, fully 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 run it like that uh, you know the security challenges are 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 kind of the same, like you know, which is the how do you incorporate security testing, vulnerability scanning in the in the CD pipelines? How do you make sure like you know the uh, the right kind of approval uh, logic is built in? Like you know who approves the code change? You know if if there is an exception, how do you automate a lot of the testing from security testing to the you know to the to the uh, you know to other performance quality or kind of uh, you know uh, testing in, in in inside your pipelines so everything that you know that we i talked about that we can do in the sort of like in a cloud native kind of world we can do almost exactly the same things in a in a in a in a, in a air gap closed uh, closed side as well there we go well i know we're out of time we're so gracious we, we had you i'm gonna remind everybody of the next episode next tuesday uh 1 p.m we're gonna have the the ceo of uh Hack the Box joining us. They do amazing work to, to create these uh, virtual labs and training environments to create the next generation of cyber uh, teams and, and tr trying to tackle that uh, cyber talent gap we're facing. Um, I'm going to leave you the last words so you can uh, uh, do that. And I uh, wanted to thank you again for, for joining us. I think this was great. I think people learn a lot of what you've done. Uh, you know, obviously thankful for all the stuff you, you brought to life uh, in your career. Uh, with that, over to you. Yeah, it uh, it was great to be here. A lot, a lot of lot of great questions and uh, great conversation here. And uh, you know, also very thankful uh, to you. You know how much uh, uh, visibility and awareness you are bringing around DevSecOps, around true DevOps, cloud native uh, approaches to Department of Defense and other uh, you know other other agencies. You know, agencies that you know you would think you know normally the perception many times in the industry you know in the on the vendor side is that the, you know uh, these kind of departments would be behind 
but it, it's great to see the you know the awareness and you know uh, the in the innovative mindset around 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 doing secure development you know devsecops devops cloud native kubernetes you know and the, and the and the the role have you 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 played uh, in in it uh, so it's it was uh, it was my pleasure having this conversation with with you today uh, thank you we're always grateful and with that thanks everybody for joining we'll see you next tuesday 1 pm eastern in the meantime you better keep up the good fight so our kids have a fighting chance at winning against china 20 years from now stay safe everybody thank you